This morning, I want to jump right in in Acts. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. We live, uh, we live in good times. We live in important times. We live in um, monumental, I would say. In the kingdom of God, in the span of eternity, I think we live in monumental, a monumental time. And I'm not really sure... <clears throat> I'm not really sure um, what that means in detail, but I know that it's critical. I know the time that we're in, the time that you're in, I know your life and my life uh, right now is, um, has passed into a critical point of time. Um, so let's start reading. Let's get right into the Word. It says this in Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 1. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Everybody say, the Lord's disciples. Saul was serving the Lord in his mind, breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples in the name of the Lord. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way. Everybody say, the way. Who's the way? Whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And here is Saul, so educated in the ways of God, came face to face with Jesus, and this is his reply, who are you, <laughs> Lord? Who are you? In other words, this isn't the God I've been, I've been trying to serve. This is something, this is uh, whatever I've built my belief system around and my thoughts around, and whatever that is, this is not that. And so he said, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Let's pray real quick. Father, we just thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that our hearts would be open. Our hearts would be fertile ground. Lord, that they would accept the seed. Lord, and that the seed would germinate and bear fruit in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. There's another word that's attached in the original language. There's another word that's attached to that last line. And there's really no way to bring that into the English language without a lot of, like if you get in the amplified version, it, it fleshes it out, but... Without being very wordy, there's no way to really include that. So that last word is the word scion. Scion is, means this. It means a young shoot or twig of a plant, especially one cut for grafting or rooting. So when he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, what he was saying, he was attaching his name to it, but he was saying, what you are persecuting is a young shoot or twig of a plant cut for grafting or rooting from me. So in other words, the church is something that I have grafted from myself and I have planted, and that's what you're coming against. In fact, what he's actually saying is, that is me. I have, I have grafted the church from myself, and you are persecuting it, so you're persecuting me. And uh, so Saul, who is highly educated, he even said this of himself. He said uh, how, that he was highly educated in all things Jewish, which meant all things God. He had studied the Torah. He had studied everything that he could learn about God. He became what he called a Pharisee of Pharisees. So he knew everything about Jewish culture. He knew everything he thought about God. He was incredibly talented, incredibly passionate, because we can see he was breathing out murderous threats, it said, which is a pretty strong, uh, strong uh, way to describe it. And so he was incredibly passionate. He had enough influence to command the military as a civilian. That's what it says. It says he went and asked for papers, and then he was accompanied by men, from the gov government officials, to go and carry this out. He had enough influence to go and ask to take command of, in modern times, it would be command of some troops to go and take care of this thing. 
So he had incredible influence. But he had one word that was missing from his extensive vocabulary, and that was this word scion. And this scion was that one piece that was missing from the puzzle that kept the picture in his life being, being, being fully recognized. He thought he was serving God, and he was doing it with all of his heart, and he was doing it so passionately. But he was missing a piece to the puzzle, and that one little piece to that puzzle was Jesus. And when you take, the, take Jesus out of the picture, then you get religion, which is what Saul, he was very religious. Um, so Sion, the church was a young shoot grafted from God himself. You know, Saul was a, a direct descendant from the tribe of Benjamin. So he understood this concept. So when Jesus said this and used this word and used this terminology, Saul understood what Jesus was saying. It made sense to Saul. And uh, so other people were there. You know, Saul was, they were riding along. There was a great light. Everyone saw the light. Saul heard a voice. Everyone else heard something. They heard a rumble. They heard something, uh, but they could not make out what it was. It was just like, you know, when, um, when God, the over heavens opened up and God said, this is my son and whom I'm uh, pleased and and everyone else that said it was thunder, maybe it was an angel. You know, that nobody really had a clarity about what just happened. They heard something. And that's kind of the same thing that's happened here is um, Saul was the only one that understood clearly what was being said uh, in the voice. So, um, so other people were there. Other people heard the sound. They saw the light. You know why? Do you think that God could appear just to Saul and nobody else? Absolutely. He's done it before. But when, when, when God does something like this, there's always witnesses. Do you know the resurrection didn't happen and then, uh, and then Jesus just went back to heaven and, and that's it? No, there were noted, documented accounts of him appearing to people after the resurrection. See, God is not trying to hide things. He's not trying to be cryptic. God always has witnesses. And I, can, I, I don't hope I don't offend anybody. But as far as I can read and tell and hear, you know, there were no witnesses except just Muhammad in the cave. There were no witnesses except... Joseph Smith, he was the only one there, and everybody just believes him. But when God does something, there's always a witness, multiple witnesses where it cannot be argued. It cannot be, you know, in fact, it freaked the, 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 the Pharisees. It freaked, freaked the, uh, uh, all of the temple, everybody in the temple. It really wigged them out because... They didn't know what to do with all the witnesses. When Jesus rose from the dead, they didn't know what to do about it. They had to get them to make up stories and pay them off. And they had to do whatever they could do because they couldn't put out the fire that was fixing to start. And that's what God is trying to do every time that he does something monumental. There are witnesses because he wants it to start a fire. He wants it to be undeniable. And so... Um, so just remember that it has nothing to do with the message, but that's just a good point to remember. That God's word always has witnesses. So if God tells you to go out and do something and, um, you know, I, we, there's really weird stuff that people say God told them to do. Have you all ever seen that, witnessed that, you know? God told me to leave my wife. God told me to leave my husband. And God told me to, um, to, to leave the church. God told me this. God told me that, you know. Guys, I want to tell you, there are a lot of voices that sound a lot like Jesus. The Bible says that, that Satan does appear as an angel of, angel of light. It was an angel that appeared to Muhammad in the cave. I mean, there, was, I mean there, is, there are angelic beings that if you saw them today, you would be, this must be God. It's so foreign to the physical concepts and constructs that we have that if we saw it, we would say, this, this has got to be God or something godly, you know. But you got to remember that every force of darkness in hell was once an angel. And an angel can appear, I mean, a, a, a demonic 
being can appear as an angel of light and convince you that what he is saying is right and true. But if you do not have witnesses, I want to encourage you guys, surround yourself. And, and if you surround yourself with witnesses and they're all just like, no, that's not God. No, 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 no. You know, and you got to shop around, you know, and you're, you know, you got to shop outside the church to get somebody to back you up. Um, so I'm just saying, guys, what God does, there are witnesses. God doesn't, God doesn't get in the habit of pulling people uh, away by themselves and giving them something to give to humanity. Jesus did everything in the open. He did everything publicly, and that's the way he worked. So this is what happened here. So Saul got knocked off his horse. Uh, he, he was blinded by the, uh, he, he experienced the light. He experienced the voice. Everyone else saw the light. They heard the voice. They didn't understand it. There were witnesses there. So, um, but the clarity of what Jesus was saying was just for Saul. Saul was the one that needed to hear. And so that was the clarity of what he was saying. So let's read on, uh, starting in verse six, it says, Jesus said, now get up. And go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he, couldn't, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus for three days. Everybody say three days. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. So Saul was blinded. Everyone else heard the sound. They saw the light. But they weren't blinded. They were able to take him by the hand. Their vision was not affected. This, was a, this wasn't a drive-by blinding. This was a, this was a, targeted, uh, a targeted blinding just for Saul. Saul was blinded for three days intentionally. The only thing that was different, if you, if you really want to uh, get into it, um, the only thing that was different for Saul is he, he understood the voice. And when he understood the voice, the word of God in his life did something. And in this case, it blinded him for three days. So the clarity of the voice, and I want to hang out for here a minute for anybody that can grasp this. Uh, the clarity of God's voice in Saul's life came with a handicap. When he understood God's word, God's word was directed directly at him. It wasn't just, I'm about to, Saul, I see your passion. I see how, how you love me. You, you, you're a little bit off track, but that's fine. I'm going to bless your socks off. That's not the word of God to, to Saul. The word of God to Saul was to change his life. And so the word of God to Saul came with a handicap. And a lot of times, I want to give you a heads up. You want the word of God specific for your life. It's not always just to blow you up. It's not always just to take you where you are and just make you more. Sometimes it's to, it's to bring you back down. To another level. Sometimes it's to get you boiled down to the concentrate of who he's made you to be and your purpose in life. See, Saul was passionate. He thought he had all the tools to please God, but he wasn't doing anything except hurting the kingdom. And when he received a word from God, it didn't just take him to places he could use his gift. The word of God, when it came to Saul, handicapped him it made him blind for three days there are other accounts of this for Zechariah. it was the 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 father of john the baptist y'all remember this he argued with god when god made him a promise he argued with god about it and god said you're not going to say another word until this baby's born and he didn't that was it he could not utter another word until the baby was born so for, for Saul, we see it was his sight. For John the Baptist's father, it was his voice because he needed to shut up for God's word to come to pass. Jacob lost his ability to walk upright. Have y'all seen this? Jacob lost his ability to walk upright on his own so that he could learn how to trust God. Jacob's name, back in the Bible, you know, in the Old Testament, Jacob's name meant deceiver. 
Everything he got, it came by deceiving, by manipulation, by his own way of doing it. And God, and he said that he wrestled with the angel and he demanded that the angel bless him. And he said, you want a blessing? Boom. Took out his hip. And he walked with a limp after that. See, he wanted God to, he wanted God to bless him, bless him, bless him. But first there had to be a crippling. Saul needed to stop looking so that he could really see God, things God's way. It's funny that it says that Saul was looking for those who belonged to the way. And Jesus called himself the way. So Saul, along the way, f- to find the way, met the way. But first he had to stop looking through his natural eyes. He had to stop leaning on his intellect and his training and all of these things because all that he was doing with that in his flesh was causing damage. Now, no, no matter what Saul was involved in, no matter what side he was on, you know people like this or maybe you are this kind of person. No matter what side you're on, you're going to have an impact. So Saul was using all of his weight against the kingdom and he was having an impact in totally the wrong way. So... Um, he had to stop looking through his natural sit in a tomb of darkness for three days before he could be resurrected into his new life. So, whether you're trying to argue with God like Zechariah, you're trying to stand on your own two feet without God's help like Jacob, or if you're looking for God in all the wrong places like Saul, God will, God can and God will be ready to take away your voice. To take away your sight. To take away your walk. Until he can feel, fulfill his promise in you. Guys, when we sign up for God's promises to be fulfilled in our life, we sign up for not just, he's, for not just blessing, not just increase, not just all these things. Sometimes and most of the time, maybe all the time, we're actually signing up for a boiling down process in the, at the beginning. So much stuff in our life. So much stuff in our life that didn't come from God. So much in our life we added to ourself. So much about our personality. You know, we've, we've done these studies on personalities and things like that. And there's, there's so much about our personality and the way that we are that he never intended. It comes from what we think about ourselves, what other people have said to us, and what has shaped us and formed us since he made us. Um, for me, guys, I, I always thought that um, I, never, I never imagined that I would really enjoy because I'm standing here in, in front of you guys, and I, I'm really enjoying this. I, I, love, uh, I love looking at you in the face and, and having the microphone and you listening to me. <laughs> that sounds really egocentric, doesn't it? No, but I, I, I love preparing. I love hearing from God. I love sharing with, what, sharing with you what God, I believe that God is saying. And that, that really energizes me. You know, and there are other people that would be up here and it, it, it would probably like, you know, they would be just like, oh, I'm glad that's over. But not for me. I mean, all of a sudden, you can ask Leah, all Sunday after I, I, if I'm up here, all Sunday, I'm just like, I mean, I'm just like wired. And the reason being is this is the, what God has, has made, one of the things that God has made me to do. There's all these thing, excuses that I've had about everything that God has called me to do. Every, you know, when I would get a word from God, it's like, you're going to do this, you know. And, and I would be like, that's not me. But it's not the me that I have made. But it is the me that he made. And so what we have to do is allow the Holy Spirit to take us through that sifting process where everything that is not from Him gets sifted away. Um, There's a story about Jesus walking through the, and His disciples was on the Sabbath and they're walking through a grain field and the disciples are plucking grain because they were hungry. And the Bible says, takes great uh, pains to give you the detail of what they're doing, that they're holding the grain in their hand and they're rubbing the grain back and forth. To get the kernel out. To get the husk off and to get the kernel out. And they were eating the kernels. And of course they got in big trouble for it. The Pharisees were watching. And uh, they called Jesus on it. Why do you let your disciples thresh grain? It wasn't illegal by the way to pick the grain. It was threshing the grain. It was the rule they made up. So 
Why are you allowing your disciples to thresh grain on the Sabbath day? And Jesus just fired right back at the Pharisees. He, he defended the disciples. Because that process was so him. That process on the Sabbath, what better time to exemplify what God does in our life. And why Jesus even came in the, in the, in the first place. Was to get all of that husk off. And get down to the kernel of who you are. Who he's made you to be. So guys, that's a process and it's a painful process. And a lot of times you're like, you know, I never understood that scripture. You know, you give and you take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's like, well, you know, you're blessed when you give. But the taking away thing is that really, you know, who wrote this scripture? You know, is this like one of those scriptures that, you know, maybe is like, we don't, we're not real clear where it comes. You know, it's just like, who is this God that is blessed because he takes away how am I blessed if you take away from me? Guys, I want to tell you, we can't be blessed until he takes away. We can't be blessed until he, we go through the process. Is this too heavy for everybody? It's heavy, isn't it? Sorry. This is, this is, this is where we're going, so just hold on. So the process, the threshing, all of these things, the threshing, the, the boiling down, the refining... All of these uh, metaphors that are used throughout the Bible, it's the way God works. Guys, I want to tell you, though, um, don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of the refining that God wants to do in your life. Um, Zachariah's first words when God gave him his voice back, you know what it was? It was the name of the promise. He sat in silence all that time until God's promise could come about. His first words... First words wasn't, man, I didn't think this was going to happen. Could you not? I mean, it wasn't a word of doubt, of cynicism, or anything like that. His first word, his name is John. Because God already told him. He was like, that was on the tip of his tongue for nine months. His name is John. And so the first words out of his mouth was the name of the Lord. The first step that Jacob took after being crippled by the angel was a step back home toward restoration for forgiveness. To be restored with his family. To walk humbly. This is the first step he took. The first thing that Saul saw when his eyes were finally opened was one of the people that he was trying to arrest. Standing in front of him, afraid of him because he knew who he was. Standing in front of him, praying for him to receive his sight. So when his eyes opened, he saw the very per person that God had called him to disciple, God had created him and called him and trained him. And everything that he went through, though he, he said it's all as garbage, God brought him through that entire process. God can use anything that, you, that has happened to you. God can use any training. God can use, you say, well, you know, I, that was in my life before I met the Lord. God can turn all of that stuff around. God used everything in Saul's life. To fulfill his ultimate plan for him. And that was to disciple and to train this very person that was standing in front of him. Three days before that, he would have been treating him like a criminal. But now that man is standing before him praying for him to receive his sight. So whatever God has done and whatever God is doing whatever God will do to thresh and to sift and to boil down. And all of the things that he does in our life is to get us to the kernel. It's to get us to the place where he can use us. To get us to that place that, uh, that Jacob and Zechariah and Saul all found themselves in. So... If you've had that shaking in your life and things have fallen away that you once trusted in... It might be trials, trials and tribulations. We say that those two words, those are our favorite words, aren't they? Trials and tribulations, you know. Ever since I got saved, it's trials and tribulations. It may be trials and tribulations, but it may be God. We serve the God that gives and takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It may be God. Just because something is being subtracted from your life, do not think for a minute that it's always the devil. 
Sometimes it may be something that needs to be subtracted from your life so that he can begin to multiply the real thing, who you really are, your main purpose. Guys, I want to tell you, the devil does steal, kill, and destroy. The biggest, I think the biggest challenge that, that most believers aren't willing to really engage with is finding out if something is of the devil or of God. God gets blamed for so much junk that the devil does. God doesn't take life. God doesn't do these things. God, there's so much stuff that we say, well, it's all God. God's in control. No, the devil has come to steal, to kill, to destroy. You've got to be able to call him on it if you're going to be blessed sevenfold on the other side of it. You've got to be able to recognize what the devil is doing and call him on it. But guys, you don't want to call God. I mean, you, you don't want to get those two mixed up. There's a, but, but there's a lot of things that God does in our life. And we turn and we fight it. And we put the face of the devil on it. And we say, it's because of him. It's because of him that I lost my job. It's because of him that this. And because of him this. And guys, if we go down that road, guys, we will never see the benefit. We'll never embrace what God is doing in our life. We've got to be able to discern those two things. Especially in the time that we're in. We've got to see the devil working. We've got to know. Jesus said that my followers, they, they hear my voice. They know my voice. The voice of another they won't follow. We've got to know what God sounds like. What God's voice is. Even when, when we walk away from like Saul, we've lost something. Even when he's taken something away from us. So... It may just be that God has taken the thing away that's keeping you from stepping fully into everything that he's promised. So now I'm going to give you my message title. My message title this morning is Shaken, Not Stirred. Do you all know the old James Bond? You know, um, we, uh, you know, if you look for an image to go along with this, it's all martini glasses. So we can't do that not in church. So, um, And I want to tell you this morning that you can be shaken or you can be stirred. You've got the choice. And if you're, um, if you're not stirred by the Holy Spirit in your heart, if you don't allow yourself to be stirred, that there's always a shaking. But blessed be the name of the Lord. It says this in Hebrews 12, 26 and 27. At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. If you aren't being stirred by the Holy Spirit, you will be shaken. But I've come to a place, I think in my life just recently, where... I'm going into a shaking, or I'm in the middle of a shaking time in my life, in so many senses of the word. And there's a peace. When you know that, that God is the one doing the shaking, there's a peace that comes. Because I know it's for my good. And I know that this process will end really good. And I know that he's paying attention to me. You see, when the disciples were threshing the grain in their hands by rubbing it together to get to the kernel, that's exactly what God does. He holds you in his hand. And he takes great care in threshing away. It's not like the big sickle comes through and, ah, that's the judgment, right? <laughs> the big sickle comes through and then there's the, the throwing it up in the air. And you know how they used to do it or how we've seen them do it. And uh, then, uh, but what he does is he plucks that one grain that is you and he begins to take away the husk to get to the kernel. So guys, if God is doing the threshing, that means I'm in the palm of his hand. That means that he's taking great care and love and attention to my life. And I know what he's trying to do. I know he's trying to get all that away to get down to what he made and who he made me to be. Because once he can get all of that other stuff out of the way, he can blow it up. 
And he can take me into everything that he's promised. And God's word, just like Saul's life, you know, when Saul, in his, even in his later years, you know, is when this conversion happened, he wasn't necessarily a teenager or a really young man. So when this happened, he had already wasted a lot of years, but God just blew him up. And it's just like, Saul, whatever you can do, I'm going to do through you. And so you want, you know, you want God to take all those things away. So, but if we're not going to allow the Spirit to stir us, and that's where I've been. The Holy Spirit comes along in a still, small voice, and He says, we got to deal with this right here. we got to deal with that. That's pride. That's self-sufficiency. That's this. That didn't come from me. That mindset that you grew up believing, that's not from me. we got to deal with this. There's a stirring that happens, very slow stirring of the Holy Spirit. And we keep going, and we keep going, and then the shaking starts. <laughs> Guys, I want to tell you, I just, and I'm always talking about business because it seems like it's my whole life sometimes, but um, I was, I've started doing, uh, like praying before our staff meetings, just coming in an hour early and just praying and uh, at work and 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 the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, actually, here's what it seemed like to me. It seemed like God Himself <laughs> looked at me, stomped His foot, snapped His finger, and pointed at me. Y'all know what that motion is like. Yeah, how many of you grew up with that kind of a dad? You know, just like really gets your attention. So it's like the snap point, and he said, it's over. And it was kind of like when you were a kid, and you were playing, and you got a little bit rambunctious, and you were in public, and he didn't want to make a scene. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And your dad snapped. and was like, quit that. And, he, he, you know, it was like his authority was, in the, in the motion, his authority was carried more weight than his words, you know. That's what I felt. And I was like, whoa, whoa, you know, God, you're supposed to be blowing me up. You're supposed to be, you know, what is this, you know? And it, but now, of course, I didn't think those things. I was just thinking, oh, dear Lord, you know. Um, but I felt that so strong. I said, oh, Holy Spirit, please tell me what this means. Because I was like, well, what's, you know, when God says it's over, what's over, what's over? And the Holy Spirit began to reveal all these little things in my life. All these little belief systems, and most of it is just uh, putting things off, just laziness, just letting time pass without really going through change. You know what I'm saying? Lethargic, just, you know, God, I know this is your will, so I'm just going to wait for it to happen, you know? And so God was just saying, all that's over. And I went into that staff meeting, and I'm, I hope I still have employees, but I went into that staff meeting with just like this fire, just like, God, I'm, I'm done. We're going forward. I get it. And guys, I think that's the way God is, 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 is moving and speaking right now. It's just like the time is shorter than it's ever been. So he's just like, all that stuff, that's over. And we've got to come to that point of decision. And since then, guys, there has been, since that, well, that was two weeks ago, since then, there has been a sifting. There's been a just like, things are almost more tearing down than building up. And it's just like, man, we were just blowing up. We were go, blowing and going. Everything was awesome. You know, but it started with that word. And that word from God, though stern, gave me great comfort. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what comes. It doesn't matter what sifting takes place. I'm in the hands of God. It doesn't matter what falls away. I'm in God's hands. And that is so awesome. There's something so awesome about being in the hands of, being in the hands of God. Yeah, God could blow me up. God could continue to increase me in all of these different ways. But in the end, He knows who would get the glory. <laughs> Doesn't He? But guys, I want to tell you, God is going to bring us to a place where He gets the glory. Where we see what he does in our life and he gets the glory. So, um, the nature of Jesus is to shift, to, I'm sorry, to shake, 
to sift, to thresh, to purify, to cleanse, and to concentrate what he has created you to be and to do. That's what he does. The Holy Spirit is in the business. That's his business. That's what conviction is all about. That's what the stirring is all about. It's constantly, it's just like, you, you know, he turns up the fire, you know, and you know the, the, the analogy about, you know, they take silver, unpurified silver, and they melt it down, but they have to stir that thing out to get those, that dross, the impurities to come to the top and so they can scrape it off. That's the work of the Holy Spirit constantly in our life. And the goal of the Holy Spirit is to get you boiled down into who he's really made you to be. Some of the more painful things that we experience as believers. So, uh, whatever is not of him must be burned up. Everybody say that with me. Say, whatever is not of him must be burned up. Not should, it must. It must. You know why I can say that with great confidence? Is because it will one day, if not now. Whatever is not of him must be burned up. We get a choice. It can either happen now in the age of grace or it can happen later on in the judgment. Guys, I want the sifting. I want the threshing, the purification, the cleansing. I want it to happen now in the age of grace with the Holy Spirit working in my life. I don't want it to happen before the throne of judgment. Where all of that's got to go. I want it to happen now. So whatever you experience. Whether stirring or shaking. It's currently being done in an age of grace. It's currently being done in this, this, this age of grace. Where the Holy Spirit is dealing with our hearts. So it's being done in an age of grace. And it's 100%. Everybody say 100%. Everybody say 100%. Say it one more time, 100%. It's 100% for your benefit. 100%. It's 100% good for you. Geared, designed for your benefit to increase you. So grace is intended to build you by first refining you. Grace is intended... To build you by first refining you. Our pastor, Pastor Cricket, is a contractor. And uh, so um, there's a lot of builders in our church and everything. But I think most people in the church uh, can grasp this concept. And uh, that you're a contractor as well or something like that. But um, I didn't know anything about construction. I, my dad is a great builder. But my dad builds from his mind. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't draw things out. He doesn't have blueprints. He doesn't have any of these things. He just starts building, and he sees it. He sees it, and he'll, he'll have to have something built, and then he sees the next thing. So that's the way my dad works, which is great for him, but it's really bad for me because I'm just like, I mean, I, I don't see what's in his head. And so I've always tried to help him. You know, growing up and everything, but I, I've never, I never could see like it on paper, you know. So, I, we got ready to build a house. We moved back from um, uh, from Bible school. We went to Bible school, and that's when Leah went through cancer. And so, we started building a house on my parents' property. They have some property in Curtis. Does anybody know where Curtis is? A few people. Okay. So there was a. We started building a house there on their property. And, of course, that meant my dad built the house and I helped. Um, so, but we started, they had, a, they had a log cabin there, one-room log cabin. And he said, we're going to start with this log cabin. That's going to be our corner. And that's going to be your master bedroom. But by the time we're done, it's going to be inside the house. You'll never know it was there. But he gave us a great start on the house. Um, so, uh, but y'all know a log house, the, log, the walls are like this. And we're doing sheetrock. And so one day my dad wasn't available. I was off work. And so I was just like, I'm going to hang some sheetrock in here. And so I began to put up a piece of, cut a piece of sheetrock to, to fit. And I'd put up the piece of sheetrock. And I would see where it touched the wall. 
Okay, it touches this log and that log, but none of the other ones. And I screwed it to those two. And then I went to the next one, and, and oh, this one. Oh, this log sticks out farther than that one. What am I going to do here? And so that's how I began to put up the sheetrock. And here I am. I'm a grown man. My dad came, came in, came home. Actually, I, I had, I'd, I'd left that, and I was at their house. And my mom came in and said, your dad is mad. And I was like, why is he mad? He's, he, she said, he's over there ripping off all of that sheetrock. And my dad doesn't waste anything. But he ripped off all of that sheetrock, and he was mad. And here I am, a grown man. I was offended. I'm just like, you know, it's like, well, you should have been here. You know, you don't just let me just build stuff. And, um, but all of that sheetrock had to be torn off. I learned a great lesson. I learned that you have to have a smooth frame stud wall for sheetrock. You have to have, see, so I learned so much that all of that sheetrock had to be torn off to start over. Um, we've been watching, do y'all watch Fixer Upper? Um, so uh, the gains are, I mean, to me, it's just like they're, epitome of, they're the epitome of God, you know, blessing somebody and putting them in the, in the public eye and stuff like that. But he is a nut. Chip Gaines is, is he's a nutso. And he's the only reason, if he wasn't on the show, it wouldn't even be worth watching. But he's a total nut. But I've seen them go into houses to renovate houses, and they begin to, to um, remove, like, tile or something like that to be able to put new tile down. And be like, oh, water damage. And then they would have to keep tearing out, tearing out, tearing out. The budget, of course, you're blowing the budget up, but they're tearing out until they get to something solid. They have to remove everything that's not solid. And when there's an addition, they say, was this done correctly? If it's not done correctly, it's got to go. And so that's the way that God does in our life so much because a good builder, and God is, a good builder has the guts to rip out until they get to something solid. And so many things in our life, either they're rotten under the surface or... They were, they were built on incorrectly. It's all got to go. And God is a great builder. So if the damage in a house, if the damage isn't dealt with, say if there's a, a roof leak, and, and Roger and Pastor Maurice and different people will appreciate this, you know, if there's a roof leak and that, that leak has gotten into the wall and you see rot somewhere, you know, that water's coming from somewhere. If you don't deal with the root of it, then it's going to end up the damage is going to end up causing that house to be condemned altogether. Because it won't stop. It has to be dealt with. So, for everybody else, I'm going to give you an example for everybody else that has, that, that construction doesn't speak to you at all. Um, have you ever seen anybody on Instagram or, or Facebook? See how I go completely the other side of it. If you just say, you know, and they've got all these filters on, on, they take a selfie and they have all these filters and everything. They've got the little hearts beside, you know, and their face is just like really smooth. And you know it's not really, but um, their face is all smoothed out. And there's a glow around them like an angel and all of this stuff. But in the background, there's like a mountain of dirty clothes. <laughs> y'all know what I'm talking about? Do y'all know these people that don't pay attention to the background? And all they see is themselves. And if somebody else looks at that and they're like, was all that behind you know because we're all looking at the house you know it's like when I look at a picture of somebody I want to see their house I'm like what's their house like you know and I'm all trying to see around them you know and um so and you can you can dress up that photo you can do everything but in the end you better you should just go back clean your house and then take a new photo or take it somewhere else and uh so maybe that'll speak to somebody um but it's no coincidence that Jesus earthly family trade was carpentry God is a builder. Jesus was born as a builder. He's always been a builder. He built the whole universe. He built you. He builds. So remember this, you know, at the end of these episodes with Fic on Fixer Upper, at the end of these episodes, they always pull back. You know, they, it shows you the process. Oh, we had to tear this out. We had to do this. We had to do that, you know. But you know it's going to be done right. And then they pull, they roll the pictures back, y'all know. And then the people just freak out. They start crying. It's like, I can't believe that's the same house. That's my house. You know, and they're just freaking out over what it's become. And God wants that for our life so bad. He, in fact, that's what a testimony is. It's, a, it's the old pictures. Like, you remember what this looked like? Oh, 
it. Here you are now. You know, that's the, what God wants to do in our life. God wants to take us from where we are, and he wants to take out what doesn't belong there. And he wants to build us into what he's designed and dreamed us to be. But when we were in our mother's womb, and he thought about us, and he planned out our life, that's what he wants for us. So we've got to get to a place where we appreciate the whole process. You know, Chip Gaines, I don't want to keep coming to that, but Chip Gaines, his big thing is demo day. You know, he has a sledgehammer, and he's just like excited about demo day, ripping stuff out, you know. I wonder if God's like that sometime. You know, we, somebody gets saved, and he just puts on his hard hat and pulls out his hammer, you know, and he's like, great, demo day. You know, that's the way it feels a lot of times. Um, so it was his word. God's word that framed the universe. It was his word that framed your life. It's his word that takes away what's keeping you from having maximum impact in the kingdom. For Saul, that word took away his, boy, uh, took away his sight until he could be brought to a place to experience what God really had designed him and created him for. Whether it's your voice, which could be interpreted as your influence. I was like, man, I used to be so important. <laughs> what happened? Y'all ever feel like that? I used to have a voice. I used to have impact. But God brought me into this new place where I don't have a voice. Or maybe it's your walk, which could be your independence. You know, I used to be able to stand on my own two feet. I used to be able to get stuff done. I used to be able to walk these things out, but God has uh, taken that away from me. And maybe it's your sight. Maybe you're in here today and you don't see the future, which is a really, really, really scary place to be. Maybe you're in here today and you're just like, I have no idea what tomorrow holds. I just feel like I've been blinded. I feel like I'm blind. I feel like I don't see the future. I don't see how it's going to work out. I don't see what God is going to do. I don't see any of these things in the future. And that's very disheartening sometimes. But whatever state of loss that you find yourself in today, and we're all being, praise God, we're all being dealt with by the Holy Spirit. Well, the scariest thing is not being dealt with by the Holy Spirit. The scariest thing is not being dealt with by the Holy Spirit. The scariest thing is not falling on the rock and being broken. The scariest thing is for the rock to fall on you and crush you. So if you're in here this morning and you're dealing with loss, welcome to the family of God. Whatever kind of loss you find yourself in, if it's something that brings you back to the purpose that you were created, blessed be the name of the Lord. Everybody say that with me this morning. Say, blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm going to take you guys through some things, if it's okay. And if you feel like you can, re you can say this with me, um, then, then please do. You give life and purpose. And you take away everything else. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You are all I need. And I need nothing else. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You have complete rule and reign in my heart. And you can dethrone every other ruler. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Everybody stand to your feet with me if you don't mind. This morning as we close. Holy Spirit. Stir us. Holy Spirit. Stir us. We desire to be sensitive to your voice. We refuse to be obstinate and stubborn and to resist you. 
we submit ourselves into the hands of the potter. God, anywhere that we've insisted on our own way, shake us until it's only you and only your way. We desire, even though our pride would say otherwise, our heart desires to be 100% who you intended us to be. And we find no pleasure in anything outside of your will, God, for us. This morning, if you're in here and you need to come to Jesus... Right now, the butterflies that you feel in your stomach when I said that, that's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is doing that because of the magnitude of the decision that you're about to make. It's not a request this morning for God to make everything in your life work out, and you know that. And maybe we come to God with that in our mind and we say, God, I need you to work all these things out. That happens to, you know, here at Victory, you know, we're kind of that, that depot, you know, for people that need God to work stuff out. But when the Holy Spirit begins to speak to us, we realize that's not even what it's about. In fact, you know if you get Jesus involved... That a lot of those things will come to an end. You know what this is. You know this isn't an invitation to get your socks blessed off. But this is an invitation to a sifting. This is an invitation to find out who you really are. And who God has really made you to be. But the butterflies that are in your stomach right now. Are telling you it's time. To start this process. And courage is needed for you to step out and to come down to the altar. And to surrender to the great architect of your life. But I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to give you that courage this morning. So I'm going to ask you on the count of three if that's you. And you say I need. And people are going to come with you. People are going to come behind you. They're going to surround you. But you know that this is a critical time, and I know that this is a critical time in eternity. This is a critical time in our world, and I know that the Holy Spirit right now is dealing with hearts in a way that He's never dealt with people before. And that's because the age of grace and the age of the Holy Spirit uh, refining us and the Holy Spirit working with us Guys, I'm telling you there's, that that is going to come to an end. The Holy Spirit, before the end comes, the Holy Spirit will be removed from the earth. The church will be raptured. But right now, the Holy Spirit is working overtime, and it's, He's really doing it with you this morning. So on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to come down. One, two, three. If you want to get saved, if you want to get right with God, I just want to ask you to come down. These people down here are going to pray with you. We're just going to give about five or six more seconds. If that's you, I need you to come down. You know you need to come down. The Holy Spirit has been after you for a long time. And it's time for you to come down and to make things right with Him. I'm only going to give a few more seconds. Is there anyone? If you're there, the Holy Spirit's not done with you. You may not have the courage. Here we go. I know God gave me this word just for you. This is powerful in my heart. I know that the Holy Spirit has, 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 has told me to point out what He's doing in your heart and, say, and tell you what to do about it. So if that's you, If there's anybody else, come on forward. If it's you and you're just there and you're just like, not today. I just I just can't I can't do this today. Holy Spirit's not done with you. Not yet. So I want you to pray this right where you're at. 
Are you ready? Everybody in here, let's pray this together. Let's pray it out loud. If you'll repeat after me, say, Jesus, I believe that you are the one who made me, that you've already paid for my failures, that you love me. And although I know I'm wrong, you will make me right with you. I surrender to the process of the refinement of my life, and I am not looking back ever. Now, if you're in here and you didn't have the courage, like some of these that are that are that have come up, and you don't have the courage, didn't have the courage, I want to tell you, get the courage and tell someone before you leave that you made that decision. That's option number two. Find someone. The Bible says that we confess with our mouth unto salvation. That means don't keep it quiet. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, find somebody. Tell them that you did that before you leave here today. I'm going to let the worship team just take the rest of this service. Praise God. God is doing some amazing things. I, Pastor Cricket was on the live stream last Wednesday. If you missed it, go back and watch it. And when he was saying what he was saying, my heart was just jumping out of my chest because I was just like, yes, that's exactly what I've been going through. Yes, that's exactly what I think God is doing. And um, but 2022, you, you know, we like to us charismatics. We like to attach a date to stuff. But 2022, I believe God is is doing some things. And, and we know that right now the word that God gave Pastor Cricket was prepare, 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 prepare right now. Y'all, a lot of people um, at work, they, they think I'm, uh, that I, they work with me, they've told me that I'm an idiot. I think they think I'm an idiot. But I just dropped a lot of money on leadership training. Way too much money. When he told me how much it was, I was like, that can't be right. But so for the next six weeks, starting Monday, I'm going through some really intense leadership training because I, I don't know what else to do. And I believe, you know, God God doesn't care how much something costs, you know, if you figured that out. But um, I don't know what else to do except prepare. Just get ready any way that I can. Prepare for growth. Prepare, prepare, prepare. Get my life in order. Get my mind right. Get my relationships right. Prepare for what God is about to do. Amen. All right, guys, I love you. If you want to stay and pray with these, with the worship team, uh, you can do that. If that was you and you, and, you didn't, and you want to come down after we close and talk to someone here at the altar, you're welcome to do that as well. All right, love you guys. Y'all have a great Sabbath. Have a great day.